Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM and Jamboree on the Air. For more information, visit scouting.org slash J O T A. This is Ham Nation, episode number 68, October 10th, 2012. George enjoys MFJ's 40th anniversary. Good evening, everybody. You're tuned to Ham Nation, and we're going to have a real blockbuster tonight because we got people all over the place. I am back. I've been on the road. Uh, all of other things, we'll talk about that later. What's most important, though, is that George is here. Now, hi, George. How are you? You're back from MFJ. I'm back, Bob, and I uh, had a big weekend there. We'll have a little video later in the show about that. They had a bigger crowd than expected, and uh, everyone had a great time. The weather cooperated except for Saturday morning when I stepped out with a pair of shorts on and uh, had to turn around and go back and redress. It got cold. <laughs> Well, we're going to get into that because I know you had a good time. I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there, but uh, <clears throat> duty calls. And uh, Cheryl, you're there from northern Illinois. Is it cold up there? And how are you doing? Hi, Bob. Hi, everybody out in the chat room, and welcome to Ham Nation. It's it's actually dropped in temperature a little bit, Bob. It's not that bad. We really can't complain. The coolness is, is well welcomed here. We had a lot of 90s in a row and lots of humidity, so we kind of like it like this. Nothing... Uh, major on the horizon uh, on this end. And, and I just wanted to wish you a, a belated happy birthday. I hope you had a great one. Thank you. I did. We'll get into that much later. Oh, golly, it was something else. But of importance to all of us is where the heck is Gordo? Ian and Don are out there running around. Gordo, where are you? What's happening? Hi there, uh, Bob and Ham Nation viewers. Don, W6GPS and I are at 5,000 feet, Lassen Pines at the foot of Mount Lassen, and we're delighted to be with you tonight, and hi to everybody on Ham Nation. Be sure and tune us in, 7268. We'll be talking to you live and direct at 7. All right, and you're on your way to Petaluma, is that right? Yes, uh, we're gonna stop in and uh, see uh, Alex and Leo and all the team Karsten and John uh, tomorrow, and uh, then we go on down to the big ham fest, Pacificon, that starts up on Friday through Sunday. Yeah, that's always a great one, and they have a lot of workshops and forums, and uh, I know that you'll be... Uh, be very busy there, so uh, we'll uh, we'll look forward to seeing what you bring back. But uh, boy, thanks to uh, to you guys for setting this up, Don. You did a good job getting it all going. And uh, w what's on the agenda for tonight? You guys are, are you are you there for the evening? Or are you traveling on? Uh, no, we're going to stay right here at this wonderful lodge, and it's actually a, a camp, and we're the only two campers tonight, other than over our shoulder, a whole bunch of deer, and we don't see deer in <laughs> California, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll say hi to them for all of the Ham Nation viewers. Okay, I should bring you some of Sarah's video. Sarah bought a camera, an infrared camera, and it's out here in our meadow on the other side of my 75-meter uh, telephone poles, and she usually has about eight or ten of them a night. Uh, she even bought some deer corn and feeds them. I should have sent you some deer corn. <laughs> but they're fun to watch, so there you go. That's great. Well, we, uh, we're really glad you're here, and I look forward to a great report uh, when you guys are uh, back and uh, telling us about what happened at Pacificon. That's, that's a great ham fest. So there you go. Um, anything else we should know, uh, Gordo, that's uh, going to happen at uh, Pacificon that, uh, that you got on your, uh, on your agenda? Hey, he's turned the headphones over to me, uh, Bob. I want to say hello, buddy. Oh. Hello to everybody at uh, Ham Nation. And uh, I've gotten all sorts of APRS uh, messages. Uh, they've been tracking us up and down, but we really want to have a uh, 
uh, a real uh, pile up tomorrow. So on APRS, W6, Gulf Papa Sierra, W6 GPS, please send a message. We'll be running down the mountain early tomorrow morning and being in Petaluma at one o'clock. So I'll turn it back over to Gordon. And uh, wait, wait a minute, Don. To... And uh, again, we look forward to uh, hearing you all tonight. And Bob, I think we've got a, a four minute short video somewhere on the show tonight to show you where we did uh, our mobile operation. Back to you, Bob. Okay, super duper. You know, wait, before you go, uh, 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 Explain to some of the people that might be tuned into Ham Nation tonight about <clears throat> APRS. We have all of these letters that we pass around, and some people don't know what in the heck we're talking about. Explain a little bit about APRS, would you please, uh, Gordo? Okay, uh, he's turned it over to me. I, I work in APRS, but APRS stands for Automatic Position uh, Reporting System, and it's basically more than just tracking. Uh, it is a status. So uh, like we uh, put on our status today on the top of the hour that uh, we were on uh, HF frequency, we had our HF frequency listed. So if people do uh, track us, they can get information uh, via APRS. So it's, a, it's a, a different form of communications, but it's fun, it's unique. It's more of a localization and where stations are and it's very, very significant, um, especially in search and rescue and in emergency situations because you can actually see uh, where your resources are. Back to you, Bob. Okay, thank you. Well, that's a wonderful piece of technology, and, and, and it's so much fun to have everybody uh, ride along with you almost. That's pretty cool. Well, I tell you what, let's do, uh, Alex, if you have that video, let's play the video that Gordo had, and we'll know a little bit more about what's going on there. And... Uh, See what's happening from Don and, and uh, Gordon. Hi there, Gordo, WB6NOA, and Don, W6GPS in a remote area, very remote of Nevada. And we're going to show you how we stay on the air for Ham Nation with HF Mobile, VHF APRS Mobile on a rent a car. Our HF antennas hung on to the Diamond K400 3H24 mount, and we make sure that we've got that mount nice and tight by tightening down the four quality Allen screws and making sure that the antenna is absolutely straight up when we put the trunk down. And we've got a little guy line on it, as you can see. We're rolling with two antennas on HF. The first one we tried was the ham stick. It worked great, but we needed more bands than the single band. So here's the Outbacker, and that's the one we're gonna put onto the Diamond Mount right now. The Diamond Mount comes with some RG174 small coax, easily goes in through the door without squishing it. Okay, we've got it screwed in. There's a 40 meter band. We can come on up here and go to the 20 meter band or the higher band, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters, and each section of the Outbacker screws together. So this Outbacker antenna is multi-band, one band at a time. Here's 40 meters, 30 meters, 20. We're gonna be on 40 meters tonight for Ham Nation. So here's our HF antenna. Look at this, this is our little tiny two meter antenna, and this is our magnetic mount two meter 440 two meters for APRS. All right, most important, 12 volts. Well, we steal a little bit of 12 volts out of the vehicle's automobile accessory socket. It then feeds into a 12 volt DC as well as it's got a little AC inverter power pack. And then that feeds into an Anderson connector. And notice I gotta have that meter on the Anderson connector. And then the Anderson connector feeds the rest of our great stuff on the dash. As you can see, we're big time on APRS. We have the AvMap 6 touchscreen. We're double checking how it's doing with a Kenwood D72. And of course, the big Kenwood D710 as our main APRS radio floppy 
And of course, there's my older G4, and that's keeping track of all of these other pieces of equipment. And you can track us for the next couple of days as we take in the ham radio convention at aprs.fi, and then put in Don's call, W6 GPS, and you'll see us all over Nevada and California. And of course, we have to stay in touch on HF, and we're doing so with the ICOM 706, or anyone can use a remote head, attach it to the base of the radio, making sure you have a good 12-volt source. And here it is, the ICOM 706 with its great readable in the sunlight head for HF. And there's our 12-volt meter tied into this battery as well as the vehicle's battery, and it shows us in the green, which means we have plenty of current to drive our 706 HF radio. So we hope to call you tonight on the air, 7268 initially, and then we're going to tune down maybe 5 or 10 kilohertz. So see you there for Ham Nation, and then see you at the convention this weekend, Pacificon in Santa Clara. Gordo, WB600 and Don, W6GPS clear. Mobile, rent a car mobile. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's great. You guys are having way too much fun out there doing that. Well, thanks a lot for all that. That takes a lot of time to, to get it all worked out, but I know you're having a good time. So uh, thanks, Gordon. And uh, anything else you got while I jump back in here is... Uh, we go through the night here on Ham Nation, a program all about ham radio, and it doesn't get any more hammy than that, right? That was great. I guess they took off. No, we're here. Are. Okay. No, we're here. A deer walked in our path. <laughs> hey, hey guys, we're gonna we're gonna sign off here. We have to go to another location, and then we're going to be on uh, give them that HF frequency seventy two sixty eight and down about five to ten kilohertz once the net rolls. And, and I'll have my APRS radio on too. So if you want to try to get a message, uh, uh, send it to W six GPS, and you APRS uh, fanatics know what we're talking about. Thanks, Bob. See ya. Oh, it's All a right. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> told you they're having way too much fun uh, and you can too if you don't have your ham radio license let's get you going because we do all have fun in all kinds of various ways i had really a lot of fun uh, sorry that i couldn't be here last couple of weeks but um I was on the road and everything else that i had had to come back to uh very Heights, Sarah says, you got to be back here because it's Jerry's birthday. Jerry is our production manager, and some of you probably have talked to Jerry and to Donna. Donna's been with us for, oh, 18, 20 years, and she's, uh, she's the service manager. You got to come back here for that. Well, they were giving a party for Jerry. Not exactly. Uh, they all lied to me. <laughs> uh, the party was um, at a local place there uh, down the road from the Heil plant. I walked in. The first thing I saw were my two daughters. I knew something was crazy. Uh, here's some pictures of this uh, wonderful party they gave me. And uh, Sarah had pulled this all off her and Jerry and Donna, uh, the cake, uh, was made by one of Donna's friends, Mary, and it was half of it was chocolate and half of it was raspberry, and oh, it was great. It was great. And uh, I, uh, there's most of the Heil crew, they weren't all there, but that's some of the, uh, the ones you guys talk to on the phone and that builds your equipment and put it all together and service it. And the guy in the purple shirt was just along for the ride that night. Uh, because I, uh, I really came there, Jerry, who is right behind me, it was his birthday a couple of days later, so I figured, oh yeah, okay, we're having a surprise birthday party for Jerry. Well, it wasn't quite that. <laughs> yes, there it is. I walked in and Jerry got me. <laughs> oh, that was crazy. Crazy night. But what was so crazy about it was I saw people that I hadn't seen in many years, people that worked for Heil Sound back in the 60s, and they put together a band, not one, but five different bands. That's John Rutter up there. He was uh, one of our chief uh, 
engineer technicians throughout all those wonderful days of building those purple amps and purple mixers, the parametric EQs, and all of the many firsts that we brought. A lot of it was done because of John. Uh, he was a very important part of those days. And uh, the guy in the base, John, his dad was a TV repairman in Marissa. And I learned so much from his dad. And here he is grown and playing the bass guitar. And uh, then there's John Rudder with his son. My goodness, of course, I haven't seen him in about 30 years. And here he comes out with his son who sings really good in the band. So we had a good time with them. And uh, that's Jerry. He's a great drummer, our production manager. If you call in and talk to Jerry, why, uh, he can uh, help you with your, uh, your microphones or your drums or anything else. He deals with all of these many, many professionals, and uh, he really knows what he's doing because he's a musician. And uh, there's my daughter, Julie, with son-in-law, Mark. And they drove a couple hundred miles to get there. That's how come I knew something was wrong when I walked into Jerry's surprise birthday party and it was my daughter <laughs> going, wait, wait a minute. I didn't get a picture of Barbie, though, and that's my uh, youngest daughter. She wasn't there. Uh, she was there, but she didn't get in the picture. And there's something. You guys better take a picture of it and you better nail it because you don't see much of that. Me dancing. Oh, boy. I don't dance worth a... Uh, yeah, 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 but... Sarah's happy with me dancing, what a little I do. Not much of a dancer, but <laughs> we had fun. And that's the whole deal. Was, uh, I was so appreciative of it. and uh, Everybody was, seemed to have a great time that night. Now, here's the big story. They've surprised me with Brianna. Brianna is the daughter of Chucky Sabatino. And back in the 60s, there were people like Ario Speedwagon and Michael McDonald and all of these wonderful guys that were going to high school in those days around the area. Well, Michael's bass player, when he uh, started really making it out on the coast, he took Chuck Sabatino uh, from the Belleville area. And Chucky was his uh, production manager. He was an incredible musician. Check this out, guys. He had a horrible thing. Along about 91, I think it was, he had a stroke. And he couldn't move anything. All Chucky Sabatino could move was his eyes. And Michael McDonald found a computer for him. They had him strapped to a board. And, and Barbara, his wife, could feed him, stand him up, or lay him down. But they found this computer that by moving his eyes, he could. It would, they, they were his mouse. Chuck wrote songs on that. Uh, computer with his eyes and they put this band together they being some of the Heil employees from back in the 60s 70s and good friends and and great uh, musicians around the Belleville area that's just east of St. Louis and they're recording some of Chucky's songs with his daughter and oh buddy can she sing I think you're probably going to hear some of this because Michael says he's going to put it on his label I just had to share this with you because I love Chucky Sabatino so much and I miss him but can you think about that writing songs w with your eyes the only thing that you can move in your body and um, thank goodness for uh, for Michael to find a computer and of course make it available to him. And of course, uh, 94, it all came to a big halt. Uh, we lost Chuck and uh, uh, he lives on in his music though. So you'll be hearing a lot about that. But I thought you'd uh, like to hear that story and see some of the birthday party. And I, I have all these people that come up to me today and say, hey, how was your birthday party? Like, how do you know? <laughs> so thanks to everybody. I had a great birthday. Yeah, oh, it was number 72 on my way to 152 or wherever. But I'm having fun in my life. Never felt better. Don't take any pills. Don't drink. I never have drank any. I never tasted uh, any kind of alcohol or beer or never smoked anything. Yeah, I know. I was running around with those that maybe, yeah, I don't know. But um, like Townsend always said, that's okay. The guy's got a soldering iron and he makes it sound good and he can drive the truck. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Oh, boy, it was fun. Hey, but George, I hear you were at another great party at the same time. and I was really wanting to get down there, but I just had gotten out of the other rehearsal stuff, and I couldn't make it, and it, it just everything conflicted. I had plans. We had rooms and everything, but 
I didn't make it. But how was your party? I know it was really good, wasn't it? Oh, it, we had a great time, Bob. It was the 40th anniversary celebration for MFJ Enterprises in Starville, Mississippi. We had a, uh, a nice crowd there. I think they had somewhere between five and 600. I don't know if they got an exact count, but uh, a number of uh, hams there that you would have known, and, and we sure missed you. But, of course, Ray was there, Ray Novak from ICOM. Um, we had uh, some representation from the AWRL. Uh, we had uh, W5KUB, Tom and his wife. We had uh, Chip and uh, Janet Margello and a number of other people. And uh, I shot a little video there. Well, actually, I shot a lot of video there. But we've got a little clip tonight that we can look at and uh, see a few of the highlights there. You know, Martin is such a nice guy. I know you've known him for a long time, Bob. And we just just had a great time all weekend long. This past weekend, I was fortunate enough to visit the MFJ 40th Anniversary Celebration and ARRL Day in the Park. Some of us arrived on Thursday evening, and Martin and the crew invited us out for dinner. There were a number of ham radio dignitaries on hand, and I was there too. Janet Margelli, KL7MF of HRO Anaheim, attended. And seated next to her is Randy Romero, who's a human resources manager at MFJ. And, of course, Martin Jew, the founder of MFJ Enterprises, K5FLU, was there. Seated next to him was Tom Medlin, who does the W5KUB.com webcast, and his wife, Kathy. On the other side of the table, we had Ray Novak, N9JA from ICOM America, Harold Kramer, WJ1B, the chief operating officer of the ARRL, and some guy who was running around with a camera. At the other end, we had Malcolm Keon, W5XX, who's the ARRL section manager from Mississippi, who is a member as well as near the top of the list on the DXCC honor roll. And seated next to him was Chip Margelli, K7JA, who's a well-known author, but you might also recognize him from his appearance on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno when he beat out the kids texting with his fast CW key. Over the years, MFJ has branched out into four different buildings at different locations in the Starkville, Mississippi area. How did it all begin? Here's the first product ever released by MFJ Enterprises. It's an op amp CW filter from 1972. The celebration began early Friday morning. Uh, as a matter of fact, people were there so early that Ray had not even had time to set up the ICOM booth yet. Of course, Tom Medlin was there bright and early, getting the W5KUB web stream on the air, and he didn't have much luck getting a 3G signal into the metal building. Fortunately, he was able to connect to the Wi-Fi there at MFJ and get on the air. I took a look around Richard Stubbs' office, and there was a photo of our friend Joe Walsh. Of course, there were other dignitaries posted on the Wall of Fame there, including a young-looking Gordon West. K5MFJ was on the air for the weekend, operating from several different locations. Of course, if you're going to operate on HF, you're going to need antennas. And here's Stephen Pan, Vice President of MFJ, erecting one of the new portable antennas. All the time, Martin was inside anchoring the 6 o'clock news. No, not actually. Uh, WCBI, the local CBS affiliate, was there getting a story for the news and doing an interview with Martin. I ran into Carl Jordan from Gigaparts next door in Huntsville. Carl, good to see you here at the show today. It's good to see you, George. You've done something a little different here on some of these ICOM radios. I have not seen these before. Tell me, tell me what the story is on this. Well, uh, Ray from uh, ICOM, who's been on your show several times, uh, he has some unique radios that uh, they had made with special paint jobs, and those are, are not available to the consumers. Uh, Gigaparts has 
uh, found a way to make that available. Uh, we found a company local to us, and we are now offering camouflage paint jobs on 7200s. This is more of a contemporary camouflage job. What, what do you call that one? Uh, desert digital. It looks <laughs> digital. We were uh, very drawn to that one. Uh, Gigaparts is, is also a computer store, and, and that one specifically was uh, very intriguing to us, and I really liked the way that it came out. Uh, so that and this, uh, the multi-cam camouflage are the, the two that we have decided to start with. Uh, we've already had these two as our, our first two uh, demo models uh, made, and we're very, very happy with the way they turned out. Uh, we are having a third one in olive drab, uh, that should be available soon, and we'll have some pictures of that available on our website. Uh, and these will be, uh, you can order these straight from Gigaparts. While I was at the ICOM table, I had to take a minute and talk with Ray about his amazing contest time machine. At a ham fest, it's very difficult to come in, put an antenna up, make sure that the band's going to work with you, the propagation's working, and then have a crowded band scenario. That's impossible to have happen. Yeah, you know, the band's not open every day, so you've probably got some kind of magic trick here. What what are you doing? You now, just like in Wizard of Oz, don't look behind the black curtain here. We're doing a little black box magic where we've recorded the contest. This one is uh, from 2003, and it's a CW contest, which we're piping over on 20 meters. And it's pure RF. I mean, what's coming into the radio is not audio. It's actually an RF signal that you can hear the contest. Now you don't, as we just disconnected the coax. And I mean, it's there's been times where at Dayton we have hams come through the contesters and they go, that's my call. <laughs> and we have to slow it down to a little bit when it's hectic at Dayton and go, no one's bootlegging your call. You were recorded and we're using it. While I was at MFJ, I did have a good opportunity to sit down and visit with Martin a while. And one thing we talked about was his filing system in his office. Now, all these <laughs> books here and all these notes back here behind us, all I, I know what they're for. Why don't you just refresh our viewers' minds uh, what what your system is there? What, what do you do with all that? Okay. Well, I have a uh, very good organized uh, system of uh, of um, filing my stuff. I mean, you see these two stacks of stuff that's right in front of me. Uh, my system is you just stick it up there, and then you just remember where it is. And for me, that works really, really well. Um, uh, most people think that I'm just piling some stuff up here, and I don't know where anything is. Uh, but in reality, um, I just pretend like I do know where it is. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, there's some notebooks that I have on the back shelf that's uh, 30, 40 years worth of notes that I've, I take down. There's always a notebook on my desk. If I get a phone call, I always write down the, uh, the date and who I'm talking to and what's it about. But most of my notes are engineering notes when I was... Um, uh, designing products, just uh, just keep notes, uh, uh, like all uh, good engineers do. So, your your filing system here then would be no uh, mystery to your typical um, engineer or, or maybe ham in that, as you use things or you acquire things, you put them somewhere and you just know where they are. So it's sort of like the shop filing system, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Uh, I have a uh, one slightly different uh, thing that I do. If I pull something out of a stack um, <clears throat> that I refer to, I put it on top of the stack, which means that I've just recently used it. Uh, but, yeah, I think, you know, I think most of us engineers' uh, filing system uh, is about the same. Just stack it up somewhere. So you're not going to lose this stuff in a hard drive crash? No, no. I just have to make sure uh, I don't have anybody that comes here and uh, clean things up. Martin has a nice collection of old amateur radio gear, and he showed me one of his recent acquisitions, which is one of the earliest Japanese amateur radio transceivers. It was just something that's, 
I just used to see in the magazine, not very often, just, oh, just a few times. And, um, I mean, it just kind of stuck with me throughout the years, and I just happened to see it. It was either on eBay or it was at a ham fest, and I couldn't believe it. You know, sometimes you run across something like that. In a few minutes on Smoke and Solder, we're going to build the MFJ 913K Ballon Kit. But I did get a chance to see the machine that MFJ uses when they assemble these. I was wondering, I, boy, it must take a long time to make these balance, but I I see here you can uh, wind any toroid in just uh, no time flat with this rig. Oh, yeah, and it, and it does it very accurately, very tightly. And uh, you can see it, it's basically uh, it's like a sewing machine. She'll pull it through, and the machine grabs it and pulls it back. And, and uh, if the uh, uh, wire needs to be uh, adjusted in any uh, certain spacing, she can do that just by pressing some buttons. Okay. It was a great weekend in Starkville, Mississippi, and there's a lot more footage that I shot that we'll be looking at in the future. The weekend's activities ended with the ARRL Day in the Park, where they fed everyone a nice southern dinner. Now, I never heard the exact figures on the number of attendees, but we think it was in the five to 600 person range. I hope you enjoyed this brief look at the MFJ 40th anniversary, and we'll have more for you soon. You know, Bob, I shot so much video there. I've got a lot of other stuff that uh, really interesting machines that they designed or modified to do what they needed there. And we'll be taking a look at uh, some of that in the future here. It's about three hours worth of video. I still have to go through to find everything. But uh, big time in Starkville. I think they're going to probably do it in another five years. And uh, Martin and I both agreed that we'd be there in another 40 years for the 80th anniversary. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's great. Well, most of those machines we saw, Martin and this guys either uh, invented them or built them, didn't they? These aren't things you just go buy at Walmart, right? <laughs> well, co correct. You know, some of it was, uh, you know, maybe commercial machines that they had modified into what they needed it to do because... You know, the kind of things that we do in ham radio, <laughs> you, you really can't mass produce machines to build them because there's not that much built. So they just, uh, there are a lot of hackers there. You know, they make what they need. Yeah, they do. I just got another pro. Well, I think I might have talked about this, what I do with it. Uh, yet another one of their, their great relays. This thing is really working. I got my 40 meter. Uh, a remote system uh, going now so we've got uh, phase dipoles on 75 and phased on 40 and it, it, it's scary uh, we're getting up to 20 db of front to back and on on that on 75 or 40 meters that's amazing and this is uh one of the key pieces to that uh, and it's a remote relay there are uh, relays inside here uh, switch from the center uh, feed point to the five antennas. And in that case out there, I only need to switch it to front and back. But that's how we do it is with the Ameritron, which is, of course, MFJ uh, box. Just run a couple of wires down into the meadow, and bingo, we're there. And boy, does it work. It works great. So uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of kudos for a great system. And there's a lot of people building the uh, remote relays, but uh, the MFJ thing is not really expensive, and it's very, very well done. I'm, I'm really impressed with the quality. Well, great. I want to um, do a couple of things. We got some really nice pictures from the uh, guys this week. You want to continue to send the pictures of your station and show us your shack, and uh, let's take a look at a couple of those. Um, we got... The first one I want to show you is from the ARRL. That's Joe Carcia. He has the golden job. He goes to work every day and runs W1AW. And behind him are all the transmitters that send out the uh, 
the bulletins and uh, all of the CW things that they do in uh, uh, in a time sequence that they publish. So it's got to be on target. And uh, Joe's a great guy, but he takes care of all the different stations at W1AW. If you ever get there, you got to spend some time with Joe. And then uh, next, we uh, we got another uh, uh, a great picture. And uh, here again, these these pictures are coming from you. Uh, the the audience. This is KD Zero PMZ, and uh, he's uh, does uh, CW and digital as well as uh, uh, single sideband. Uh, nice station, nice setup. The next one is coming from PY Two JF. What a great station! But the thing about that is, he uh, he's worked. A uh, hundred countries, and done all of this stuff in in a record uh, record time. He challenged himself to do it uh, in a month, and he did. And 31 days after he challenged himself, four hours a day, he worked 111 countries using a 950 uh, Yaesu and just 100 watts and a, a Cushcraft uh, multiband antenna. I thought that was really cool, and uh, we thank. Uh, Roberto, for sending that in, what a nice picture. Uh, it's, a, it's really cool, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to hear him on the net one of these days. That's another station of WNUW. That's their, uh, um, their satellite station. If you uh, go to uh, 1AW, you'll see that satellite station. That's really kind of neat. And then W3EX. Uh, that's a nice layout. So we want to show these to you, and I want you to uh, send your pictures to us. Just uh, You've got all of our emails. Just uh, send it to uh, look my, my address up on the QRZ or, or here at the bottom of the screen, and uh, you want to do that. While you're on the Internet, i gotta, I got to tell you something that's going on. There's a contest. You know, the, our media department's been running a contest uh, a lot on their Facebook page, and you got to get signed up to Ohio Sound web, uh, Facebook page, and you do that over our website, just HeilSound.com. And the reason is they got a really cool one coming up here. There's the uh, website. Just go up to the top where the Facebook is. This is a contest that's going to send you to a, a one of the new Dropkick Murphy. If you haven't heard of this band, this is a really cool band. Been around for a long time. And uh, they, uh, uh, they're they using, of course, all of our stuff. And uh, you're going to get some tickets and get to meet the band and hear, hear some great music. And uh, they actually play ba bagpipes. George, did you know about the Dropkick Murphys? They have a bagpipe in this band, a bagpipe and accordion. I have yeah. heard the name before, but no, I sure didn't know they had that. That's a that's a lot of wind, Bob. It is, and then they got this great guitar player, uh, and, and a wonderful, uh, wonderful vocalist. It's really a cool band, and uh, so anyway, you're gonna get to win some free tickets. All you gotta do is sign up to our Facebook page, and you never know they were constantly giving away stuff there. So you want to get in and sign up on that. And there's two pages: the amateur radio page. And, of course, the, uh, the pro page. You want to sign up to both of them because they're always running things there. So it's kind of fun. And that's what it's all about is having fun. And uh, here we try to keep it all, uh, call in, all intact. Um, I think Leo is going to talk about some ICOM stuff. Let's go see what Leo's got tonight about ICOM. Hi there, hams. How are you? Good to see you. Welcome to the Ham Nation Radio Shack, of course, completely ICOM, all ICOM all the time. We love ICOM, and ICOM is not just a great maker of ham radios, transceivers, and repeaters. They also are very civic-minded. They've been supporting the Boy Scouts of America since 1981. They are supporting the Radio Merit Badge program. I love that, to encourage more Boy Scouts to become hams. In fact, this month, October 20th and 21st, they'll be supporting the Jamboree on the Air. This is the 55th annual Jamboree on the Air. It's the largest scouting event in the world. Seven, get this, 750,000 scouts, three-quarters of a million scouts, 6,000 amateur radio locations, 150 countries, 
ICOM is here to help the Scouts have a successful event this year. As part of their collaboration, they're going to provide up to 10 amateur radio loan stations for local Scout councils. Each loan station includes a very nice ICOM 7200 IF receiver, transceiver. It's that HF transceiver I've been talking about. An antenna tuner, power supply, desk mic. I hope it's Ohio. We got to make sure it's Ohio. External speaker, dipole antenna, and all the necessary cables to get scouts on the air. Share the fun. Share the hobby by getting involved. Get on the air. Hand out QSOs to these scouts. Three quarters of a million of them all over the world. That's October 20th and 21st. And, of course, it's online at scouting.org slash Jota, J-O-T-A, Jamboree on the air. That's the website. There's all the gear that ICOM's going to provide. This is, it's so important to get scouts into this for the emergency services, if nothing else. Also, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation to enter their weekly drawing for ICOM swag. T-shirts, hats, the like. Congratulations to all our winners so far. And to check out the winning participants this week, icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And you can see the link that says view last week's winners and enter to win yourself. Hey, we thank ICOM America for all that they do, for their great hardware, their great equipment. It wouldn't be our, our ham shack without them. And for their support of the Boy Scouts of America. Now back to you. Ham Nation continues. All right, Mr. Leo. And I know you're busy doing the new studio there, so we'll hope to we see what you got in store and then maybe uh, get you back on here with us here in a couple of weeks and see what's going on. Well, I think we need to go down and uh, pick up Don and see what's going on in Newsline. By the way, uh, Bill Pasternak has had a real tough bout. He's, uh, I think, just released today from the hospital, and, uh, boy, that's not good. And uh, we're, we're hoping and praying for Bill. He's, uh, he's a great guy and does so much for ham radio. So let's go down. Don Wilbanks, what you got from Newsline tonight? From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 1,834, these are the Ham Nation headlines. For Wednesday, October 10, 2012, 200 tiny ham radio satellites will be going into space in the not-too-distant future. The project is called KICKSAT. It's an amateur radio CubeSat technology mission designed to demonstrate the deployment and operation of prototype Sprite, or tiny, chipsats. The KICKSAT space frame is a CubeSat being built to carry and deploy 200 sprites that will provide an avionics bus, power, communications, command, and data handling functions. It will be mated with a two-unit deployer that has been developed to house the KICKSAT sprites. As to the sprites, they are tiny spacecraft that include power, sensor, communication systems, all built on a printed circuit board measuring 3.5 by 3.5 centimeters with a thickness of 2.5 millimeters and a mass of only about 5 grams. The sprite is intended as a general purpose sensor platform for microelectronic mechanical or other chip scale sensors with the ability to downlink data to the ground from low earth orbit. After deployment, telemetry and sensor measurements of the individual sprites will be received through Cornell's ground station in Ithaca, New York, as well as several other Amish radio ground stations around the world. The sprites are expected to re-enter the atmosphere and burn up within a few days or weeks, depending on atmospheric conditions. Their best case maximum over the lifetime is estimated at just around six weeks. That's Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, reporting. Chipsets like these sprites represent a new technology that will both open space access to hobbyists and students and enable new types of science missions. More is online at spacecraftresearch.com slash kicksat. Fred Lloyd, AA7BQ, reports that he's added an additional server to the QRZ.com system and moved a few things around to improve performance. All servers have been upgraded to the latest Ubuntu Linux edition 12.04. Also, several functions have been interchanged between the various cloud servers that host QRZ.com at Amazon Web Services. AA7BQ says that so far the performance looks really great on all parts of the system. The call sign server, which was routinely at 90% busy, now loafs along at around 50%. NASA astronaut Sunita Williams, KD-5PLB, is the new commander of the International Space Station. Williams took over the leadership role on Saturday, September 15th, becoming only the second female commander in the orbiting lab's 14-year history. Sunita Williams is a captain in the U.S. Navy and is flying on her second long-duration space mission. The first launched into space in 2007, and she spent 195 consecutive days on orbit, setting a record for the longest single space flight by a female astronaut. 
Williams launched to the station in July and will command its Expedition 33 crew before returning to Earth in November. And finally this week, the biggest event of the scouting season involving ham radio is drawing near. It's the largest scouting event in the world. Last year, it drew more than 750,000 scouts in 150 countries to the ham radio frequencies manned by 6,000 amateur radio operators. It's the 55th annual Jamboree on the Air, which runs the weekend of October 20th and 21st. Jim Wilson, K5ND, National Jamboree on the Air organizer for the United States, as well as chairman of the National Radio Scouting Committee, says it's a chance for amateur radio to introduce young men and women to the adventure and fun of the hobby. It's not a contest, it's a conversation. It's about talking with scouts and ideally scouts talking with other scouts, either across town, across the state, across the nation, or, or across the world. Wilson says in the United States, many scout councils will be conducting camperees on Jota weekend, and amateurs will set up stations and put the Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Venturers on the air. Jota is a great way to do that, not only to grow the ranks of amateur radio, but to just introduce kids who may never participate in amateur radio so that they understand that it's magic, it's fun, and it contributes to our communities in a very positive way. For the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Mark Abramovich, NT3V in Philadelphia. Again, Joda is October 20th and 21st. And that's all from Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news, brought to you each and every week for 35 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. Before we go, Newsline Editor-in-Chief Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, has been in the hospital the last few days. He's feeling much better now and should be going home any time now. I know everyone at Twit, Ham Nation, and those watching and listening join me in wishing him a speedy recovery. We care for you, Bill. So for now, I'm Don Wilbanks, ae 5 dw 73 We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Thanks so much, Don. You always do such a great job. We enjoy the, the new format with the, the video stuff with the pictures and stuff. It's great. We really hope Bill uh, comes around and gets all of that behind him. I'm uh, working on my soldering iron, George, getting ready for your smoke and solder. I have to continually tighten up my, uh, my tip. Of course, I don't have it turned on yet but boy that's important is it if you don't keep that old tip tightened up and clean you don't get anywhere with your solder do you you're right about that bob and you got to keep it clean too you know i i just bought one of these i've never used one of these before it's got you know something similar to steel wool except uh, a little coarser in there you're supposed to clean your tip on that instead of a sponge but I, I don't know. I haven't done any soldering since this came in last week, so we'll have to get back with you and let you know how that works. You know, uh, I'm glad they mentioned about the jamboree on the air. I got this nice poster in here today. The only thing was there's no note with it, and uh, it doesn't say jamboree on the air. I thought that's what it was, but wasn't sure about that. Well, this week we've had uh, a number of our viewers standing by patiently waiting to bill their 4-to-1 ballon. And we want to thank MFJ for building this kit, just especially for Smoke and Solder and Ham Nation viewers. So, Alex, if you'll roll the video there. This week on Smoke and Solder, we're going to build an antenna ballon. Now, what is a ballon? Well, it's a balance-to-unbalance matching device. And there are two different types, voltage balance and current balance, and most often, amateur radio operators use current balance. A current balance can reduce or eliminate stray RF that's often found on coax. The MFJ913K current balance kit is a 4 to 1 balance designed to replace the center insulator of a dipole antenna, and it's made of two large low permeability ferrite cores. It's rated at 300 watts. Unlike some other balance, the 913 makes direct electrical connection to the antenna. Now, for those of you building along at home, the first thing we want to do is go over the parts list and make sure we have everything we need. The first item we need is the SO239 connector. Then we'll need one solder lug, two toroids, and now the instructions say one on this next item, but actually there's two in the kit and that's white 20 gauge wire that's 24 inches long and the same thing for the black wire we have two of those 20 gauge 24 inch 
We need two one half by 440 screws. And we need two 440 keep nuts. Now, these are the nuts that have the tooth lock washer made to the bottom of them. We have six 1024 nuts, three 1024 eye bolts, two number 10 fender washers, six number 10 lock washers, one top PVC cap that the eye bolts go into, one bottom PVC cap for the SO239, a piece of PVC pipe for the enclosure, and one 12 inch number 14 bare copper wire. Now we'll want to wind these. Looking at the picture in the book with the two wires side by side, the black wire on the left and the white wire on the right. Now as we do this, we want to be careful that we do not kink the wire and that we get the wire good and tight down on the toroid. Now we'll continue this white black white black pattern all the way around. There are 15 turns around this transformer, but you'll notice there's only 14 complete turns. The 15th turn is a half turn at the beginning and end of the coil. Here's what our transformers should look like once they're wound. Now you'll notice that I tried to keep the black and the white wires together as much as possible with a little gap in between each one and no wires cross over the other. To get the pairs spaced evenly, I used a small screwdriver to kind of measure the spacing between each turn of the pairs of wires. Once we've done the first toroid, we'll do the second one identical. Now we've got the two toroids laid out here by the diagrams in the book. At this point, they'll become different because we're gonna clip the leads to match the figures in the book. So we'll need to label these so we don't get them confused. This is T1, and we'll mark the other one as T2. Now, looking at the diagrams in the book, we'll clip the wires back to sort of match the same length that they're displaying there. So the white wire on the top of the coil here will be cut back. That will be wire B, and the black wire will be wire A. After we've clipped wire B, then we'll clip the remaining two wires, C and D, just a little bit. Now we'll clip the wires on the other transformer, and it's just backwards. The black wire will be B, and we'll cut it off shorter. Wires C and D are the same, so we'll just trim them slightly. The next thing we need to do is couple the two transformers together, so we'll strip about a quarter inch of the insulation off the end of all these leads. Now, looking at the diagram in the book, we'll stack the two transformers on top of each other in the same orientation, and we'll twist the two short leads together. 
Next, we'll take the two wires marked C, which are both black wires, and twist them together. And we'll do the same thing with the two white wires marked D, and twist them together. Then we'll compare carefully with the diagram in the book to make sure that we did it right. Now I'll solder the two short wires together, and they say bend these back out of the way and make sure they don't come in contact with anything. But I'll take it a step further and use some of my favorite 3M Super Weather Strip adhesive as an insulator to protect these wires. Now we'll mount the SO239 in the end cap. We'll use the two 440 half inch screws and nuts to install this. Now it's a little hard to get my needle nose pliers down in there, so I'm going to use a piece of heat shrink tubing to slip over each nut and thereby allow me to get it in and thread it quicker. Now one of these nuts will have a solder lug under it so we have a ground connection. After that we'll put the eye bolts into the other end cap using the proper nuts and washers for each and we make sure that we've got them all good and tight. Now we'll move back to the transformer and I'm going to tin the white pair of wires D and the black pair of wires C I'll start by putting a little of my favorite solder flux paste on there and then apply just a little bit of solder so when we go to attach these to the SO239 connector we won't have to get it quite as hot. The white pair of wires will solder to the center conductor of the SO239 and the black pair of wires will go to that solder lug. Now it's time to put the main cover on the unit so we'll put a little PVC glue on the end of the cover here that's furthest from the two holes drilled in there and we'll slip this over our transformers and down into the end cap. We'll take the bare copper wire and cut that into two pieces and we'll stick that through the two holes, solder one of them to the black wire and we'll solder the other to the remaining white wire. Now it's not in the instructions, but I'll use a little of my 3M Super Weather Strip adhesive here to seal around the two holes where these bare copper wires go inside. Now the last step, we'll use a little of our PVC glue again on the end cap with the eye bolts, and we'll slide that on the end of the cover here, and we'll line up the two eye bolts to where they're directly above the two bare copper wires, and we'll slide it down just to where they touch the wires. Now the ballon assembly is complete. It's time to test it out. So I have installed three 100 ohm resistors in series across the two bare copper wires, connected my MFJ antenna analyzer, and I see here that it's measuring approximately 50 ohms, and that'll vary a little bit as I change the frequency, but that tells me that uh, we're in luck here. That's a 300 ohm load and it's doing a 4 to 1 transformation so that our transmitter will see 50 ohms. Now there's one final thing I'll do and that is mark this balance so I know what it is. It's a 4 to 1 at 300 watts. So there you have it. There's not that much to a balance and it's not that difficult to build especially if you're using the MFJ 913 kit. And here it is, and it actually works. I don't have it on antenna yet, but uh, I'll be building one soon. And let's see what we've got coming up here. Um, next week, well, let me say this first. In a couple of weeks, I'm not sure the exact date, we're going to be building the Softrock RX TOX Ensemble. You can find that at 5 com. That's a software-defined radio kit. Uh, order yours now, and you can follow along at home, just like we do with this ballon. And uh, probably next week, I've got to go back and do a little troubleshooting on my open beacon that I built this past month. Uh, someone called to my attention, actually a couple of someone's called to my attention, that when I was calculating my output power, I used the wrong formulas and conversions for that. And instead of having the 480 milliwatts that I thought I had, I actually had 60, and it needed to be 300. So we're going to go back to the drawing board on that. And so next week will be a good opportunity to talk about troubleshooting. Uh, I had not planned it that way, but, you know, that's the way it's going to turn out. Now, you know, we gave away an IC7000 here on Ham Nation. 
uh, a few weeks ago. If you didn't win that, well, ICOM's got another opportunity for you. We're giving away an IC7200 to celebrate the seventh anniversary of AmateurLogic.tv. Uh, you can uh, tune in Monday's episode, October the 15th, and get more details on how you can enter that. And it's basically going to be a random drawing, so one person's chance is as good as the next. In this week's contest, m last week I asked a question. Uh, in that uh, open beacon kit, I had three toroids in there. Two of them were inductors. What was the last toroid used for? And Bill Kershaw... W1WHK knew the answer, and he said it's a bifiller transformer. Congratulations, Bill. You won the MFJ telescoping antenna that we've got here. It says it's for scanner and shortwave use, but you can use it on your 2-meter or 440 handy talkie. And this week, we're giving away another copy of Jerry Buston's Constructing HF Wire Antennas. If you would like to win that, then send me an email at hamnationcontest at gmail.com and tell me what kind of balance do hams most often use, a current balance or a voltage balance. Bob? Well, that's all great stuff. I, uh, I really uh, like the balance. That was cool. That was cool. And uh, I, I told you earlier I'd let you know a little more about what happened today. It's been a real heavy day here. I got back to Pleasant Hope after all of my uh, running around and birthday party. And we uh, brought in the buck up truck and finally put the, the uh, tower up. This is a we'll have video and pictures of this. Uh, it, it all happened so fast today. <laughs> it's a 55 foot uh, crank up one of the new Wilson uh, uh, U.S. Tower. Uh, monopoles. It's really cool and it, it cranks up to 55 foot, tilts over and uh, we got it all up and going today. Of course, we didn't crank it up. But it's uh, it's all set. Concrete works well. And um, we're, we're okay for that. In this, about an hour later, my 600 pound theater organ shows up on a truck from Illinois and um, we had to cut a hole in the side of the uh, studio out here because it won't fit through a standard door. So I chose a book, out, a page out of uh, Pete Townsend's book where <laughs> he put a nine-foot bosun door for a grand piano in his little studio years ago. And I visited him and I asked him, how'd you do that? And he said, well, I punched a hole in the side of the wall and brought a crane in. Well, that's what we did today. And... Uh, they brought in this really special lift, and it uh, picked up the console. It's a console. I've, I've played it several times here on the show. You know how big it is. This is a three-manual, 24-rank uh, monster, 600-pounder. And uh, they picked it up. Of course, there were, there were four guys that picked it up out of the truck and brought it on the lift, lifted it up. And a couple of weeks ago, we had some guys come in and put a, a special four-foot, six-foot door uh, in the uh, second story, and we opened that door and shoved her in, and I got to play about an hour and a half tonight. I'm back home. Oh, boy, oh, boy, I miss playing. So anyway, that's what I did today, and uh, whew, it, was, uh, it was something. But I don't want to try to get on the nets tonight. I was hoping Mike would be with us on the show. You know, they broke the record last week with 100 check-ins on 40 meters. How cool. We want to get Mike back on here one of these nights to let him tell you about it. And then Bill, uh, K5LN, is going to be on 14 uh, 260. But, oh, boy, uh, conditions have really been stinko lately. So let's see what happens. The last few days have been terrible. So hopefully we can catch you, Bill, uh, 14 268 and uh, 7268. Let's see if we can, eh, plus or minus, because there might be people on them. So, Cheryl, we've got a couple of minutes left. What you got coming from the chat room tonight? Oh, well, there's just a few of them in here. For George, I've got a couple here. Uh, KB6YAF Russell asks, George, can you file them down and retin them? It was to do with your soldering section of your video. Uh, I suppose you can. I've seen people do that before, but um, I hadn't had too good a luck with that. If you keep it clean, that tip will last a long time. But if you let it get dirty and uh, get pitted, you might as well throw it away and get another one. But as long as you can clean it up and it still looks good and shiny on it, keep using it. 
And one one other quick one regarding the video too from comes from N7 YMW Mark W. He says, when you're doing those those uh, those uh, turns when you were doing that, he says, do you count the inside or outside loops when you're counting? Hmm, I counted complete loops, and so you go all the way around, and then the uh, the where you start the loop is a half a turn, and when you come out is another half a turn, so those two together are one more turn. So if it's 15 turns, you actually got 14 complete ones and then the two ends. And and finally, uh, VE7, WNK, he asks, uh, wanted, he wanted to know, when's the best time to use a one-to-one ballon versus a four-to-one ballon? What, what application warrants which one? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, Bob, um, I bet you know the answer to that one. I, I know what I think it is. Well, one-to-one -one is when you have a 50-ohm antenna and a 50-ohm transmitter, and you just don't want any ground loops. So you use a one-to-one, -one and it stays at 50 ohms or whatever, but you're going to probably be 50 ohms, and you don't have that, uh, that ground laying on the shield. And then... Of course, the four to one, that's if you'd have like a 300 ohm antenna and you have a 50 ohm transmitter, what do you do? You use a four to one ballon. Was I right, instructor? That's what I was thinking, Bob. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I tested this ballon here, I put uh, three 100 ohm resistors in series, which is 300 ohms, put that where the antenna mm -hmm. goes, and I measured 50 ohms on my meter there, so I think you're exactly right. That's exactly right. And you just never, ever want to put up uh, an antenna without a one-to-one -one if it's a 50-ohm antenna because it relieves all of that RFI potential. Well, not all of it, but much of it from that. Because you, Otherwise, you, you're going to have stray RF laying on that shield, and oh, boy, we have a problem. What else you got, Cheryl? I got one for you, Bob. N5VMO, he, he'd like to know. I think you're the antenna guy here. I need help in selecting an indoor HF multi-banded uh, antenna where no outside antennas and no balcony is available. So is there anything that you might uh, suggest? Oh, man, that's a toughie. And let me tell you the answer to that, though. You go back in the early archives of Ham Nation, and as I tell everybody, it's very simple. You put Ham Nation into Google. And when you do that, you're going to see all of the replays. Back about program, what was it? Maybe 10, 20, is the thing from W0FM. He has worked, I think, 200 plus countries with all indoor antennas. You want to go back and check that out. It's really a great program, and I think that you might get an answer from some of his really experience that's all he does is indoor antennas he can't have any outdoor antennas and man he works the world so check it out on some of the early shows here of ham nation from my good friend w0fm he'll help you you know what you're right bob i actually remember that show i think it's after show number 29 i came on board so it's in the 29 30 31 or 32 area because it was really an excellent uh, video he had quite a lot of stuff jam-packed in his attic right i screwed that up huh i thought it was 10. <laughs> things go fast but that's all right look through it you'll you'll see it okay <laughs> anyway, um, I think that's that pretty much is it. I just wanted to make sure you're having a great birthday week, a great birthday month, because someone cheered me on. I think it was QDA. He said, oh, no, it's not a birthday week. It's a birthday month, so enjoy yours. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And uh, my birthday was given to me uh, today also. I mean, sh sh uh, the whole crew at Heil Sound and, of course, my wonderful wife and the president of the company, Sarah, has just done everything over the top for my birthday. But I really got it today when I saw the tower all standing by itself, and I got to spend an hour and a half with my beloved 24 rank theater organ. And I'll have some video of that. It's pretty sensational how we got that thing in the second story. But uh, that's okay. It was fun, and I'm uh, back playing again every day. I play every day that I that I'm with it and I haven't been with it since what about May I've been out here so it's here with me so away we go okay and uh, I think that's it. Did you, everything else okay then Cheryl you got everything answered for now 
I have everything answered. I just wanted to, to wish uh, Bill Pasternak a swift recovery. We really uh, are rooting for him, and uh, we love everything he does with Amateur Radio Newsline, and uh, you get better quick, Bill. That's all I have to say. Thanks for coming and joining us at Ham Nation, everybody. We'll see you next time. K9BIK, clear. Okay, we'll see you on uh, 3850 or 47. Uh-oh, there he is. There he is. There's Mike. So oh, Mikey's ready to go. Watch this. Have I turned my antenna the other way? He's about 15 down. There you go. Ha! Ah, boy, does that work. Phased dipoles, trust me. It is really something. Doesn't cost any money. Just a couple of pieces of wire. And away you go. A couple of relays. All right. We'll see you. 7268, 14268, 3850 or wherever. But we thank everybody for watching and being with us here on Ham Nation. Pass the word. Just tell them, put Ham Nation into Google. You will love it. And uh, we're, we're, we're just loving all the growth of amateur radio and partially because of Ham Nation. So thanks to all that took great part tonight. And we'll see you on the air somewhere. A little high, a little low. We'll be there, though. <laughs> 7-3, everybody, from K9EID. Bye.